My name is Håkon Wim Lee. I'm the CTO of Opera Software. It's good to be here at Lincoln in Zurich. I have many colleagues with me. Uh, Opera has a huge contingent uh, here at this conference. We're eagerly contributing to the Blink code, and uh, we, we, we feel good about being part of, of this community. What I will be talking about is multi-column and paginated layouts on mobile. There have been some discussions over the past year about how to best proceed with adding new features to Blink. You know, the priorities is currently mobile and performance. Is that compatible with also making sure we can display content in a, in a, in a, in a, a way that's appealing to, to users? And also, can we make sure we can display all the content that the users want to see? And I think multi-call um, is a fantastic solution to both those issues. We both address the, the mobile side of things as well as making compelling presentations. And I'm going to be showing some of those uh, presentations uh, today. I'm going to be demoing. I'm going to be showing four multi-column uh, implementations during my talk. And um, one person has actually implemented three of those. And he's sitting in the back. Uh, his name is Morten. Can you wave your hand, Morten? Morten will be speaking in the next session uh, about the real implementation. He's, he's doing the real code. I'm just doing the CSS part. Um, so he's the hero. There was somebody asked why weren't these uh, presentations scheduled side by side. Um, but that was a joke, I guess. Yes. You get it? Yeah. All right. I'm also going to be going a little bit back into history here. Um, first, we go way back. Um, the Greeks had fantastic multi-column implementations. Uh, their code is still standing, uh, a little rough. But uh, that is uh, an inspiration. Um, this is also going a little bit back in history, but not going as far. This is from Switzerland. Um, this is the world's biggest machine. The, it's not a multi-column structure. It's more of a mm, SVG, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but this is where the web was born. It's not very far from here, an hour or two on the train. This is where the web was invented. Um, about 25 years ago or so. And I'm going to show you just briefly a few um, pictures from where this happened. I was working in the team there at the time. This is from 1994 when we put out the first public web terminal uh, so that the students at CERN could you know, get to try out the web and we could gain some valuable feedback. Is this thing really going to work or not? So all the pipes there on the left, I don't know what's in those, but I know a little about, bit about the Sun workstation sitting in the in the corner on the right. And here's more. Here's the, the board next to it. Um, here's the, the slogan we used, World Wide Web. You click, and we do the rest. And I think we can conclude here and now that it wasn't really the marketing that made the web a big success. <laughs> it was probably more likely the specifications and the implementations, which is a good thing. But back to those pipes for a second. This is These are the pipes that that I don't know what's inside. You know, CERN is a physics laboratory. I'm not a physicist. But what I know is that Tim Berners-Lee, in order to get to his office, he had to walk past these pipes uh, every day. And my hypothesis is that those pipes were actually the inspiration for the HTML tags. You know, we have H1, H2, H3, right? <laughs> One a little bit bigger than the other. And then we have the LI, ULP paragraphs this way, over there. Yeah, you get it. Very good. Here's the corridor where the web was invented. And you see the, the, the offices are lined up there, uh, quite structured. This is a scientific environment where you know, structuring information is more important than its presentation. And this is reflected also in the HTML code. It's, it tries to structure information. It doesn't say anything about how to present it. Whereas if you go above ground, um, outside, uh, at CERN, you see some of the most beautiful landscape you can imagine. Um, this is looking at Mont Blanc from the, from the CERN campus. Uh, and the city of Geneva is here in the middle. Mont Blanc is up here, fantastically beautiful on a clear day. And J the Jura Mountains, turning 180 degrees, you have the Jura Mountains behind you. So it's, it's, it's really um, a, a very beautiful, very appealing to the, to the human and what struck me at CERN was that 
you know, we need to have compelling presentations for web content. We can't just have the very textual, very structured. That's not what appeals to people. Uh, having the text-based format makes it possible to do uh, indexing, to have search engines, to, 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 to do intelligent things with text. But in order to appeal to most people, not just the scientists, we need to have compelling presentations. And that's why I proposed CSS in 1994. Here's a screenshot of the first um, uh, proposal. It was called Cascading HTML Style Sheets. It was published uh, about 20 years ago. Um, a lot of things have happened since then, but the fundamental uh, model is the same. You have a small language, CSS, which sits next to an, uh, another language, HTML, and they two work together. HTML is independent of the presentation. CSS takes care of the presentation. And CSS can be media dependent. That is, you can write a style sheet for a phone or for printing or for a PC, whereas the HTML code ideally shouldn't be uh, tied to any specific media. We don't really want HTML to become a page description language. And that separation still stands, which is, I think, a very good thing. Jumping ahead, we now have many CSS specifications. We have many modules. One of them is called CSS multi-column layout. It's been in the work for a long time. It's now in CR, and it's implemented by uh, pretty much all the browsers. Um, they're not they're not all finished, and the specification also needs a little more work in order to get to, to get to recommendation status. But the model is done, and it's implemented, and it's being used. So just briefly, what is, what is it that we're talking about? What is, uh, uh, what is multi-column layout? Um, we've tried to invent in the new word here, column, columnation. Pagination, you know, probably know what it is. That means splitting content into pages. Splitting content into columns is really very much the same thing. And we can call it columnation, where you take some text and you put it into a different container, a different, a different uh, column here, and the text flow will go from one to the other, and it will go automatically. You don't have to... You don't have to specify where the column break should be. You can do that if you want. But the text flows automatically from one column to the next. Just like they do when you print a document, you have text flow that goes from one page to the, to the next. And one of the things that I think we can get out of the multi-call code that Morton uh, is working on is we can actually support pagination as well with the same code, um, which should simplify our, our lives quite a bit. On the web today, multi-call CSS layout is used by a lot of pages in Wikipedia. There are 32 million Wikipedia pages out there. Most of them use multi-column for references. And here's one example where you see that a long list of references has been put into two columns. And this is done automatically. This is not, this is not a table layout, for example. In the past, you would have used tables for this. But this is much more flexible so that when you have um, when you have a long list of references, then uh, you get into two columns, and the height of this is automatically calculated, which means that you don't see all the references at the same time on the, on the same screen. You actually have to scroll down to get to, to the one below 14 there. And this is a fine use of, 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 of multicol. Um, it saves white space. Uh, it makes lines shorter, so it's easier to read. Uh, but it doesn't really take out the full potential of multi-call. I think we can do a whole lot more with multi-call than this. Um, although it's very good that Wikipedia uses it, because I think otherwise it wouldn't uh, hit the radar. It wouldn't show up on the usage statistics uh, when, the, when the Google people try to count what, what features are used. It's very good that we had you know, Wikipedia out there with 32 million pages. Otherwise, we might have been dropped, dropped uh, along the way there. Here's another example of, um, it's more a divine example of uh, the use of multi-column layout. This is Gutenberg's uh, Bible, done in Europe uh, in the 1460s, not too long from here, about three hours on the train. Um, he didn't invent multi-column layout, uh, and he didn't invent hyphenation either, but he used both of them 
in new and almost perfect ways. And, and the layout of this Bible, um, Latin uh, version of, of a Bible, is still admired for its typography. And researchers actually are still studying this, and they can't really find out exactly how he did it, because it's so, it's so perfect. Um, one of the things I want to do in, in life is to make sure that we can use uh, CSS to recreate uh, the Gutenberg uh, Bible. There's a few, few things that we need to, to work on for that, but um, it's going to be there one day. Going to a more pedestrian example, here's um, a newspaper clipping. That was the first that popped up when I searched for multi-column layout at some point. Um, this is a British newspaper, the Bristol Observer, that reports uh, about a new rescue center for, for cats. And I want you to try to memorize the structure of this article. Um, the important thing isn't really the cats or the content, but really the presentation. Because this is a quite common uh, presentation used in traditional media. In, um, in newspapers, and we need to be able to recreate that. So let's see how, we, how we're doing, how we would go about uh, doing that. Let's see. Let's start out with a, with a basic HTML page. Here's a, just a very simple HTML page that um, has a different text, a different image, but it's, it's the, the very simple thing that all of us have written at some point, um, where we have a picture floating to the right, and we have a headline that we style, and, and a little introduction paragraph there. There's nothing magic about this. And then we'll try to, to add multi-column layout to it. So we, we, we write a little bit code. Can you see the code up here? Where we say article, columns two. We say we want two columns here. OK, so the browser will give us two columns. And now we have to scroll up and down in order to read, the, to read the text, which may not be ideal, but it's not as bad either. And we use more of the screen. And that's a common theme here. We're using more of the screen. There's not a lot of wasted uh, white space here. And line, line lengths are still um, are, are shorter, typically, when we use multi-column layout. But it's still not good, I think. We can do better. Here's, here we've set the, the, the columns to be not a fixed number. Instead, we set a, a, an ideal column uh, length, an ideal line length, 14 m's. And that means when we, when we resize this uh, window here, we will actually see that the number of column changes. So we go from 3 down to 2 and down to 1. Uh, automatically. This is not something that you have to write any JavaScript or media queries for. This just happens automatically when you set the ideal uh, length of your uh, lines in the columns. But we still have that scroll bar on the right, and we have to go up and down a lot to, to read the whole text. Here, we've constrained the height of the element. We set that overflow shouldn't go uh, and extend underneath. It should go to another page. And this is, this is a big switch. This is a switch from a, from a scrolled environment to a paginated environment. In the physical world, the Romans invented this about 2,000 years ago, when they took the, the scrolls that one used to write most of the content in. It was either stone or vellum or, you know, and these things were rolled up. But the Romans started splitting things, and that had... Uh, very important um, uh, results. It, it made it much more portable. Uh, it made it much more compact. You could stack paper. Instead of having these rolls that you had to be very careful with, you could stack uh, uh, them into books, in which you could put on a shelf or travel along with you. So it changed the world of, publi of publishing by, by, doing, uh, by doing pages. And on the web, uh, we're still doing the scroll bars. We're still doing the scrolls, which have some benefit. This is not really trying to get rid of the scroll bar, but it's showing that there is another model there as well. There are pages. So when I press the page down button, I will go to the next page. But you don't use the scroll bar anymore. You use, the, you use um, uh, on my laptop, page up, page down. On a tablet, it's even better. There I would use typically the, my fingers. I would do gestures. 
So to get to the next page, I would just drag uh, with my with my finger, and on the on the on the phone, I would maybe shake a little or uh, just do something to indicate that I want to see the next uh, the next page. But we can do more here. Let's continue. Um, here I've taken the image and I say that it should span two columns. This is very typical in, in, in newspaper layouts that you have the images span two columns or maybe three columns and you float it to the top uh, corner instead of it being um, in, in line in the content. So you say you want, the, you want the image up on the right and you want the uh, heading up on the left. Then we can add another image and we float it to the, to the bottom. So we have one up in the corner here and, and one down in the corner here. This is still very easy to do. Very simple CSS statements. Here I've added column span all so that the heading just takes up uh, all the space. I still th I, I think this is so easy, I don't need to explain this. This is really, if you can read a little bit of code, you will understand immediately how this, this works. Here, adding two more uh, pictures. We're now getting very close to, remember where we started? You know, this structure here? where you have these, 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 these images uh, floating to the corners. Uh, so this is essentially the same structure, except that we have better animals, of course. So we can pretty much recreate what the newspaper typographer wanted to, to convey. That's good, but it's not truly important for us. Recreating the Bristol newspaper, that's not really what the web needs. What we need is something that scales across many devices. So what happens then when we try to scale this here? Let's try to do that. So I'm not using any media queries here. I'm using a f very few lines of CSS code, about 10 lines of CSS code. And what we see is that the code makes it so that the presentation looks okay all along. We don't know what the typographer would have wanted it to look like over a three-page thing. We can only guess. But I think that by setting multi-column layout, we get responsive design uh, by default. Uh, responsive layout, the thing responds, and I don't have to write any code for it. The number of columns adjusts by itself, and the images adjust by themselves. And we get reasonable layouts for all sorts of devices automatically, all the way down to a very narrow screen on a very uh, small uh, phone. So this is eight lines or 10 lines. They varies a little bit, my examples. But it's very few lines of, of, of CSS code. Um, I'll just do one more demo. Um, Here's my boat. Here we have a top, top floating image, and then we have a, a, a heading that spans two columns, and we say that it should go on the right-hand side. And again, we see that this scales beautifully from a very wide screen to a very narrow, narrow screen. Something else happened there. All right. So responsive by design, I think, is, is important because I don't think we can expect authors to write presentations for all screen sizes. What we've seen is that authors like to have their big screen layouts, and they test it, and they show their managers, and it looks fine. And then when it comes to mobile screens, then it, it, it doesn't work so well. We've seen this a lot at Opera over the last decade. Of course, things are changing a little now. Mobile is becoming more the focus. Maybe it has to be the other way around. Maybe it has to be that you know it, it, we will start out by designing for mobile, and then we have to make sure it looks good on wide screens as well. In any case, this will work. If you just set your columns to be the your ideal length, this you automatically get scalable, responsive pages. Trying to replicate newspaper articles or, or thinking what they um, would do isn't, isn't all we're, we're, we're looking at. There are some fantastic examples of using paged media in uh, electronic books. Uh, this screenshot is from a book that came out a couple of years ago, and I'm going to show you a small video 
um, where the guy who did it, can you see that? Can we hear, can you get sound? All right. So here's a presentation about the, this project. So for the past year and a half, my team at Push Pop Press and Charlie Melchers and Melcher Media have been working on creating the first feature-length interactive book. It's called Our Choice and the author is Al Gore. It's the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth and it explores all the solutions that will solve the climate crisis. The book starts like this. This is the cover. As the globe spins, we can see our location and we can open the book and swipe through the chapters to browse the book. Or we can scroll through the pages at the bottom. And if we want to zoom into a page, we can just open it up. And anything you see in the book, you can pick up with two fingers and lift off the page and open up. And if OK, so I, I think this is very cool, very compelling. It's a great experience on the iPad. You can buy it as an app, but it's a native app. I want to make sure we can do this on the web. And it's quite easy to do. If we have multi-call support, we can do the pagination part as well. We can do the top floating images that he was using. Uh, we can do, the, do the, even the transitions that he was showing. And I'm going to try demo this running in Chrome. I've had some help from my colleagues writing this. Um, presentation here. But this is all done in CSS with a little bit of JavaScript, um, HTML, CSS, and a little bit of JavaScript. And as you see, I, as I swipe through these chapters, the stripe at the bottom follows along. And I can click and get into the real text and do, so there, there's kind of two levels of pages here, two stripes that are kind of synced, but you can kind of use them in, independently as well. And I think in order for the, the web to be competitive with native apps for stuff like this, which I think should be the core of the web, presentation of textual and image content, we need to be able to offer this kind of functionality very easily. We've been able to patch up this, this, this uh, demo here, and I think it, it works, works well. But I think it can be a lot easier. We can still make it a lot easier. Some people will ask. You know, why not use Java, JavaScript for this? If it's possible to do, why not just use JavaScript to, to create this? And you can make that argument for just about anything. You can use JavaScript to do hyphenation. You can do line breaking. You can do table layout even uh, using JavaScript. Uh, you probably even don't need JavaScript. If you do anything we want, we can do in an animated GIF. Um, but that doesn't create the world that um, content publishers would want to work in. I think we need to expose some of the basic building blocks to developers um, so that JavaScript can access them. Um, and those building blocks is, for the sake of uh, textual content, those are, we start with the glyphs, then we have the line, then we have the column, and then we have the page. And those are the basic building blocks of publishing, and it's been like that for the last thousand years or so. And I think they, those concepts are going to continue to be with us, so I think we should have good support for those concepts in whatever platforms we're working on. Um, the guy who did the, the electronic book went on to Facebook, actually, and his team just released Facebook Paper, which is another way of doing page presentations um, using content from the web. I don't know if you've seen this. I actually haven't tried it myself. I'm not in the, in the right zone. It's, it's being zoned for now. But there are some good um, videos on the web as well to show uh, how this can be used. And I think it's, it's compelling, again. And I think we should support this, this on the web. Uh, then there's Flip, uh, Flipboard, of course, that also a lot of people use. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have three minutes on a bus, you know, you open up from one page uh, to the other much, much more easily than trying to manage a scroll bar. And even just seeing the scroll bar is hard. OK, so going to the, going to the specifications a little bit, there's the multi-column specification that does most of what I've been showing here. Uh, but there's also um, CSS figures, which is the one-working group specification. 
which which does um, some of the extra stuff if you want. Um, there are very large platforms out there. It's not working. Okay, let me try that. Is that better? No. No. Okay, it seems to be a battery problem. Let me try. Let me try this instead. Can you hear me now? OK, thank you. Perfect. So OK, so we have the multicall specification, which is the fundamentals. And that's been implemented by, um, by a bunch of uh, almost all the rendering engines have done basic multicall by now. There's a little bit here. I think Morton has a patch, a patch waiting to be upstream to do a, a column span all for, for Blink as well. And then the stuff below here is written up in the CSS figures specification. And that's where we get things like spanning just two out of five columns. That's where we get floating to the top or bottom of a column. And that's where we get um, um, floating inside and outside in page transitions. I haven't shown those yet. Because I've, I've concentrated on the stuff that's, that's um, relevant for mobile. There's also a print-based world which needs these features. This is a PDF that's been generated by, by Prince, one of the products that take HTML and creates PDF. And they have other challenges that I'm not going to go much into here, just show the, the pull quotes that are shown on the side here. They had to be floated to the outside. It's not just top and bottom. Now we have to be outside on the page and inside on the page. So that's a complexity that we don't have to deal with, I think, in the browsers, not, not yet at least. Um, but it's something that the print people are eager to, to have supported. Then there's page transitions, which I think is, is very important. Um, I'm going to try to run another demo to show what that is. Before that, though, look at the code here. This is HTML code that has been part of the HTML specification for uh, a very long time, but it has never really been used for, for much good. Uh, it's metadata showing what's the next article, uh, next document, what's the previous document, and what's the um, an index page. And there's a couple more of those that can be added to the header of, of an HTML page. So what can we do with those? Let's see. So now we're in another implementation again. You see it's an HTML page. And we go, we're in a paged environment. We have a little ad here. We get to the... We get to the end of the article, and we're still in E1. Can you see the address there? Yeah. There's E1. And then we continue on, and then we end up in E2. So what happened there was that the browser looked at the headers and saw, OK, I have a next article waiting, so I can go to the next one. So it preloads it, and it shows it in a very, in a mode that's, you know, the user doesn't realize that there's another document uh, there, I think. But, but you, can, you can then easily navigate, seamlessly navigate from, from one document to the other in kind of an edition of a newspaper or a magazine or, 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 uh, or something. And likewise, we can use the index to go to an overview page. So we can move around in this, in this landscape without really clicking anymore. I think the sort of point and click metaphor that the web was based on for its, for its childhood and teenage years, maybe it's not going to last so long. At least it's not going to be alone. I think we need to be kind of in the next, the gesture mode, where you don't click. You actually just continue on and on. You swipe. And this we can support using the features that I've been, been demonstrating here. Um, also, I think there's something fundamentally, something psychologically. Oops, that was the wrong one. Let's see. All right. Let's see. One second. Let me try to. Uh, here we are. OK, so this is Alice in Wonderland done in, in pages. I don't think anyone has read Alice in Wonderland on the web using scroll bars. It's not just the reading experience that you're looking for. Whereas 
if you have a child on your lap, then sitting there and swiping on the tablet makes a lot more sense. I could have shown you this on the tablet, but I'll do it on my laptop just so the, so the people on the other side can see it as well. And then when you do, when you do read for a child, then the, the flipping of a page, the turning of a page becomes an event in itself. Is there going to be an interesting picture on the next page? You know, What's there? The, the turning of the page is a feature, not a bug. I was so inspired when I, when I did these demos um, about Alice in Wonderland that I, I wrote the children's book uh, myself. Um, I wonder if I could read it to you. What's that? Only if it's nap time afterwards. Nap time afterwards. OK, you can nap all along, I think. It's very short. It's about trolls. Do you know about trolls? Do you know what a troll is? Troll is actually one of the very few Norwegian words that have made it to English over the last 100 years. Of course, in Norway, we have real trolls, not the ones you find on the internet. And some of them are nice, and some of them are nasty. Did you know that a troll lives near you? Turn the page to find it. Oh, shoot. Doesn't work. <laughs> OK, at this stage, a, 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 a picture of me should appear here. Sorry about that. OK, I, what I would like to illustrate is that we should be able to interface, of course, cameras and all the stuff that was talked about in the, in the previous talk. Uh, and this shows the problem with it. The code doesn't always work. I thought I had it. I didn't. But I think combining all this, combining the camera, combining the GPS like we saw in the electronic book version, um, combining page presentation, we can create some very, very compelling content. And we need to do this. And if we don't do this, people will go to native uh, applications. They won't stick to the web for philosophical reasons. We had to make sure that we can uh, do it uh, in a compelling manner. And the good news is that multicall is an important part of this solution, and it's implemented by all the browsers. We just need to sprinkle it with a little bit of extra functionality to get to the paged mode, to get the things to float to the top and bottom, and then we can both replicate the content as it's been seen uh, for the last thousand years, as well as create compelling content for the future. Thank you.